on World News Tonight. Titanic search. Race against time to find a submarine that went missing on a trip to the Titanic wreckage. On the right path, Antony Blinken meets Chinese President Xi Jinping in an attempt to lower geopolitical tensions. How successful was this mission? More on this tonight. Sea Treaty. The United Nations ratified the Treaty of the High Seas, which provides framework for environmental protections to biodiversity in international waters. And Piano du Lac. Audiences, young and old, get captivated by a piano recital that floats on water. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A uh, very good evening and you are watching World News. We are commencing today's news with the USA and Canada's joint search in quest for a missing submarine. As US and Canadian ships and planes search for a submarine that went missing more than a day earlier off the coast of southeastern Canada while taking tourists to explore the wreckage of the Titanic. It's a race against time for U.S. and Canadian Coast Guards to find the five people on board a missing submarine. On Sunday, a submersible vessel operated by Ocean Gate Expeditions disappeared off the coast of southeastern Canada almost two hours after beginning a dive to explore the remains of the infamous Titanic. The U.S. Coast Guard said there was one pilot and four passengers on board and that the vessel had the capacity to be submerged for 96 hours. However, they added it was unclear whether it was still underwater or had surfaced and was unable to communicate. Uh, the location of the search is approximately 900 miles uh, east of Cape Cod uh, in a water depth of uh, roughly 13,000 feet. It is a, a remote area uh, and it is a, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area but we are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. The U.S. and Canadian Coast Guards have deployed several aircrafts and ships to scour both the depths and the surface while reaching out to commercial vessels for help. Ocean Gate has been attempting deep diving missions since at least 2017 and successfully reached the Titanic wreck for the first time in 2021 and then again in 2022. Among the passengers believed to be on board the missing sub is British billionaire Hamish Harding, a businessman who posted on social media about joining the dive. In 1912, during its maiden voyage from England to New York, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank, killing over 1,500 people. The wreckage, discovered in 1985, separated into two main pieces 400 miles off of Newfoundland, Canada, and has fascinated generations ever since. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping and during a critical visit to Beijing. No tangible outcome has been achieved, but they both agreed that the world needs a stable U.S.-China relation. Washington and Beijing have both agreed on the need to stabilize their relationship. At a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Monday, Chinese President Xi Jinping underlined the importance of progress being made through the secretary's visit. Face-to-face -face interactions should always be based on mutual respect and sincerity. I hope that through this visit, Mr. Secretary, you will make more positive contributions to stabilizing China-U.S. relations. Speaking at a press briefing after his meeting with Xi, Blinken said senior-level talks between the two sides must continue. In every meeting, I stress that direct engagement and sustained communication at senior levels is the best way to responsibly manage our differences and ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And I heard the same from my Chinese counterparts. The secretary also called on Beijing to use its influence to press Pyongyang to put a stop to further provocations in the region. He insisted that China is in a unique position to encourage North Korea to act responsibly. However, it remains to be seen whether the two sides can resolve long-standing issues involving Taiwan, trade and human rights. Despite the challenge, Blinken stressed that it is the responsibility of both countries to find a path forward, and it is in the interest of the world that they do so. The White House said Blinken had candid, substantive and constructive conversations with the Chinese leader and called the talks a good step forward. 
And we're at, what we want is competition, not conflict. We've been very clear about that. But again, I think it is a is a good step forward. We believe it's a good step forward uh, for Secretary to have been uh, to have a constructive conversation uh, with uh, President Xi. And Although no major breakthrough was made, pundits hope that Blinken's visit could pave the way for more bilateral meetings, perhaps even a summit in the future between Biden and Xi. An Israeli raid into one of the tensest cities in the occupied West Bank erupted into a massive firefight, leaving at least five Palestinians dead and dozens wounded as the Israeli military struggled to rescue troops under heavy fire. Israeli commandos backed by helicopter gunships killed at least five Palestinians, including a teenager, during an unusually fierce clash in the occupied West Bank on Monday. These Palestinian journalists were caught in the crossfire but later evacuated by ambulance. One was shot in the waist. Troops raided the flashpoint town of Jenin to arrest Palestinians suspected of attacks and came under fire from gunmen, Israel's military said. Video of this shows an explosion enveloping an armoured troop transport as shots ring out. At least seven Israeli military personnel were wounded. In a rare strike by helicopter that showed the severity of the fighting, an Apache fired on an open area to drive back gunmen, a military spokesperson said, as casualties were brought out of the troop transport. Under heavy fire, the army was forced to mount an extraction mission to pull out a number of its vehicles trapped in the fighting. The Palestinian Health Ministry said at least 66 Palestinians were wounded in the clashes. Yusuf Saka's 15-year-old son, Ahmed, was killed. He was decent, polite and respectful. But his problem was that the moment the army raided, he ran towards them. He wanted to after his friend Omar was killed. The death of his friend Omar was very painful for him. At least two of the dead belonged to Islamic Jihad. The armed group said Israel's use of aircraft, quote, will push our fighters to use tools that will surprise the enemy. Hamas said its fighters also took part in the clashes, and an official from the Fatah party said fighters from nearby cities had arrived in Jenin to support the local gunmen. Jenin and other areas of the northern West Bank have been a focus of months of stepped-up raids by Israel amid a spate of Palestinian street attacks in its cities. Britain's parliament delivered another blow to the political career of former Prime Minister Boris Johnson when it endorsed a report that concluded that he deliberately lied over rule-breaking parties. In another blow to Boris Johnson's political career, British MPs have overwhelmingly backed a damning report which found he deliberately misled parliament over lockdown parties. The eyes to the right, 354. The nose to the left, seven. The eyes have it, the eyes have it. Johnson abruptly resigned from Parliament earlier this month after seeing an advanced copy of the report, which had recommended that the former Prime Minister be suspended for three months. The truth is incontrovertible. MPs debated the report's findings for five hours ahead of Monday's vote, with most politicians speaking out against Johnson. Labour MP Thangam Debonair was one of them. Now, the backdrop to this report is the thousands of red hearts on the COVID memorial wall just over the river. For each, there is a story around them of awful loss, of grief compounded by goodbyes done over smartphones, lives ended alone, people robbed of precious time together. It is not easy to sit on in judgment on friends and colleagues. Johnson also received criticism from within his own party. His former Prime Minister, Theresa May. But friendship working together should not get in the way of doing what is right. Johnson has categorised the committee as a kangaroo court and said the report was, quote, intended to be the final knife thrust in a protracted political assassination. Don't you want to vote? Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and many members of his cabinet were noticeably absent from Monday's vote for fear of increasing tensions with Conservative Party members who remain loyal to Johnson. At least one student was killed in a school shooting in Brazil's southern city of Cambe, and another student was wounded and hospitalized. Let's take a look. A school shooting in Brazil's southern city of Cambe left at least one student dead on Monday. 
Officials say the shooter has been arrested and is a former student of the school. They also say he entered the premises by saying he wanted to request his school records. One father told his son was wounded and hospitalized. Luan is in stable condition and they're now waiting for improvement so that he can go into the operating room. Today he was under medication all day and everyone is praying for everything to go well. But that's it. He has a bullet in his head and water is coming in. He needs to stabilize through medication. Now Luan needs to respond to the medication and then he will go into the operating room. Brazil's president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva expressed great sadness that another young life was taken by hatred and violence. He said it is urgent to find ways to, quote, build a path to peace in schools. In April, a man armed with a small axe climbed over a wall into a crash in southern Brazil and killed four children. In March, in a Sao Paulo school, a 13-year-old student stabbed a teacher to death and wounded five others. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Jail Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny went on trial on extremism charges that could see his prison time extended for decades as part of wider government efforts to silence dissent. The case comes more than a year into Russia's full-scale offensive in Ukraine, which ushered in a new wave of legal proceedings against Moscow's critics, with many now in exile or in jail. In this maximum security prison in Malekova, Alexei Navalny faces a new trial on Monday. This time, the Russian opposition leader is facing charges of extremism and rehabilitating the Nazi ideology. He could be given up to 30 years in prison. But his defence team, which only had 10 days to examine an extensive case file, has condemned the accusations which they say are unclear. According to one of its representatives, Alexei Navalny is being tried for his political work. In spite of his detention, Navalny has continued to denounce the Kremlin, particularly by criticizing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. After being imprisoned in Siberia and treated in a German hospital for a poison attack he blamed on the Kremlin, Navalny decided to return to Russia in January 2021 and was immediately arrested. He is currently serving a nine-year prison term for accusations of fraud, allegations he denies. Navalny has endured tough living conditions while in prison. He says he has been put in solitary confinement some 16 times. Although his physical health has deteriorated, he maintained that he was keeping his spirits up at the beginning of June. The latest trial comes as the Kremlin reinforces its crackdown on opponents. Since the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most key opposition figures have been imprisoned. The most recent is Lilia Chenicheva, one of Navalny's allies, who was sentenced in June to seven years in prison for extremism. Now, a massive heat wave has blanketed South Korea for several days, with Seoul seeing temperatures spike to their highest in 26 years. Observers note that climate change is affecting the entire world, as not only South Korea, but also many other countries are suffering from extreme temperatures. For three consecutive days, South Korea's main cities, including the capital, have been hit by a heat wave, bringing much higher temperatures than usual. On Monday, the daytime high in Seoul reached over 35 degrees Celsius, surpassing the highest temperature recorded for the city in June since 1997. The government issued a heat wave warning on Sunday for Seoul and major western cities such as Daejeon and Gwangju, which are also experiencing temperatures around 35 degrees. Officials said the extreme heat was being cast by the air floor from a migratory anti-cyclone. Today, the migratory anticyclone is shifting away from northeast South Korea, bringing clear skies and hotter temperatures due to a southward airflow. As air flows in from the south, temperatures will rise even further, leading to hotter weather conditions. According to the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, the estimated number of deaths due to heat-related illnesses this year has come earlier by over a month compared to last year. As of last Saturday, a total of 104 heat-related cases have been reported, which is 20 more than the same period last year. Not only in Korea, but also around the world, various countries have been experiencing an early heat wave in mid-June. 
the hit is causing a rise in related fatalities, including 54 deaths reported over the past three days in northern India, where temperatures have reached 40 to 45 degrees Celsius on consecutive days, accompanied by extreme weather events such as storms. It is expected that the early summer hit, with temperatures around 30 degrees Celsius, will continue in South Korea throughout most of June. Members of the United Nations adopted the first ever treaty to protect marine life in the high seas on Monday, with the UN's chief hailing the historic agreement as giving the ocean a fighting chance. It's taken more than 20 years, but the UN high seas agreement is finally off the ground as UN member states formally agreed on the text for the treaty. The body's secretary-general hailed this as a historic achievement. The ocean is the lifeblood of our planet. And today, you have pumped new life and hope to give the ocean a fighting chance. Climate change is eating our planet, disrupting weather patterns and ocean currents, and altering marine ecosystems and the species living there. The High Seas Treaty will be the world's first international accord to protect the high seas, the two-thirds of the world's oceans which make up international waters outside any single state's jurisdiction. The landmark agreement will contain tools to tackle several critical elements of the ocean, including the degradation of ecosystems, loss of biodiversity and the surging warming of ocean waters due to climate change. A key measure will also make global international waters into marine protected areas, which were previously only held by national territorial waters and could limit fishing, shipping and exploration activities as long as it's consistent with conservation goals. Another point would allow countries and entities to fairly share any marine animal, plant or microbial discoveries between themselves, which could benefit poorer nations who may have not had those exploration resources. The treaty, though agreed on in March, must now be signed and ratified by 60 nations before it comes into force. Open for signatures in late September, it remains to be seen, however, how many countries will come on board. International donors pledged close to $15 billion in humanitarian aid to Sudan and the broader region, responding to a call by United Nations to boost aid amid a conflict that has forced some 22 million people from their homes. International donors pledged close to $1.5 billion in humanitarian aid for Sudan and the broader region on Monday. That's roughly half the $3 billion the UN says is needed. Secretary General Antonio Guterres sounded the alarm on the conflict the same day. I am particularly concerned by reports of gender-based and sexual violence and by the ethnic dimension of the violence in Janina. Targeted attacks against civilians based on their ethnic identities could amount to crimes against humanity. Among the biggest donors, Germany, the U.S. and Qatar. The UN says it's setting aside another $22 million for the most urgent needs. The war between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces began in mid-April. It sparked amid ongoing tensions over an internationally backed plan for a transition towards elections under a civilian government. The conflict has left more than 3,000 people dead, turned the capital Khartoum into a war zone, and triggered deadly violence in other parts of the country including the western region of Darfur. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Airbus announced a record 500 plane deal with Indian airline Indigo on one day of the Paris Air Show. A strong demand for jets and missiles vied for attention with the industry's supply chain problems. A man wielding an axe has attacked diners at three Chinese restaurants in Auckland, New Zealand, wounding at least four people, according to police and witnesses. Cristiano Ronaldo is making history by representing Portugal for the 200th time in a Euro 2024 qualifier against Iceland. Ronaldo is Portugal's most capped player and record scorer with 122 goals. A project to expand roads and bridges to ease congestion in Cairo has put thousands of tombs in a vast and ancient Islamic cemetery under threat. Named as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it contains tombs and artifacts dating back to 7th century AD. 
UNESCO says the area should be preserved and that it will examine the case in September 2023. The World Food Programme said it hopes to resume food aid distribution in Ethiopia by July once it has received greater control over how beneficiaries are selected. More than 20 million people need humanitarian assistance in the region. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now let's take a look at a French pianist, Violette Prevost, entertaining hundreds of Madrid residents who gathered around Prado Longo Artificial Lake to watch her performance on a floating piano. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.